Hello YouTube. Uh, so uh, a while ago on some forum I answered a request to explain Lewis's triviality results. Uh, I figure why not make a video out of it. There might be others out there for whom the same info is useful. Um, so my exposition largely follows the one given by Jonathan Bennett in A Philosophical Guide to Conditionals. Though I am simplifying things somewhat, uh, if you're at all interested in the philosophy of conditionals, I strongly recommend Bennett's book. It's well worth reading. Right, um, Lewis's triviality results are generally taken as an attack on a famous thesis about indicative conditionals called Stallmacher's hypothesis. Uh, but before we get to that, we need some background. So, take an indicative conditional, if A, then B. Under what circumstances should we believe it, just in general? Uh, well, a famous suggestion from Frank Ramsey is that when we evaluate an indicative conditional, uh, what, we, what we do when we evaluate if A then B, what we do is hypothetically add A to our belief system and then see whether this results in a high probability for B. So essentially we ask ourselves, what's the probability of B on the supposition that A is true? Right? So suppose I wish to evaluate the conditional, if the moon is made of cheese, then the moon is edible. What I do is provisionally accept the proposition, the moon is made of cheese. Then I ask myself, well, on this supposition, what's the probability that the moon is edible? Now, I would say quite high. Uh, most cheese is edible after all, so the conditional is probably true. As you can see, if A then B can be assigned a high probability, even if the probabilities of A alone or B alone are low. I think it's extremely unlikely that the moon is made of cheese and it's uh, extremely unlikely that the moon is edible. Uh, but if the moon is made of cheese, then the moon is edible, seems true to me. B is true given A, it's true on the supposition of A. So with that said, uh, here is Stallnacker's hypothesis. Um, Right, so what does this mean? Well, we read P A as the probability of A, right? Uh, and we read P B stroke A as the probability of B given A. So Stallnacher's hypothesis is the probability of if A then B is equal to the probability of B given A just as long as the probability of A is greater than zero. And I'll explain this, um, this last part a bit later. Uh, but what matters now is the probability of if A then, if A then B equals the probability of B given A. Um, as Lewis put it quite succinctly, probabilities of conditionals are conditional probabilities. What we're trying to do here is formulate uh, Ramsey's intuitive idea. Okay, so the probability of if A then B can be found by considering the probability of B on the supposition of A. Now, this raises the question, how do we calculate the probability of B given A? A popular suggestion is the equation known as the ratio formula, which is this. So that is, the probability of B given A is equal to the probability of A and B divided by the probability of A. It might not be immediately obvious that this is plausible, so we need to consider it a little bit. Right, let's note a couple of points before we do so. First of all, recall that probabilities lie between 0 and 1. So 1 is certainty, 0 0.9 is very likely, 0 0.1 is very unlikely, 0 is impossible. And of course we can get as fine-grained as we like, we can have probabilities like 0 0.836221, <laughs> etc. if we want to. Um, but they lie between 0 and 1. Uh, so second, note that we should never assign a higher probability to A and B than to A alone. Uh, the probability of A and B should only ever be less than or equal to the probability of A. Right, so with these points in mind, suppose, let's consider the ratio formula now, and suppose I assign a high probability to A and B, and a high probability to A alone. Uh, so say A is Socrates is a man and B is Socrates is mortal. Well, in this case, 
I'm dividing a very higher probability by something slightly higher than it, um, or equal to it, uh, and that will result in something close to 1. Okay. So now suppose I assign a low probability to A and B and a low probability to A alone, as when A is the moon is made of cheese and B is the moon is edible. A and B is extremely unlikely, but so is A, taken alone. In this case, I'm dividing a very low number by something only slightly higher than it, resulting in something close to 1. These results make sense. If we assign a similar probability to both A and B and to A alone, then it must be that A either induces the truth of B or leaves the truth of B untouched. So we'd want to say that the probability of B given A is high. OK, and that's what the ratio formula would give us. Right, now suppose there's a large discrepancy between my probability for A and B and my probability for A. I think that A and B is very unlikely while A alone is very likely. Um, say A is Socrates is mortal and B is Socrates is a fish. Well, in this case, I'm dividing a very low number by a very high one, resulting in another low number. Again, this makes sense. If the probability of A and B is much lower than the probability of A, then the probability of B given A must be low. A either induces the falsity of B, or it leaves the falsity of B untouched. So we can see that the ratio formula is quite plausible. I say it's plausible, I don't say it's uncontested, there is some debate about it, but we don't need to go into that here. Now if we accept the ratio formula, we can see why we have to add where the probability of A is greater than zero to Stolnacher's hypothesis. If the probability of A is zero, then the equation for the probability of B given A is probability of A and B divided by zero, which of course is undefined. You can't divide by zero. Now that we can't give the probability of B given A when the probability of A is zero might be considered a flaw in the ratio formula. If you consider the proposition I do not exist, many of you would assign a probability of zero to that, but you can still think quite rationally about what would be the case on the supposition that you don't exist. Again, this is all debated and again we don't need to go into it, right? We'll just assume that the ratio formula is, is right. <clears throat> so, that's Stolnacher's hypothesis. So to remind you, here it is again, that's Stolnacher's hypothesis, here it is. Probability of if A then B equals the probability of B given A. And remember we calculate the probability of B given A by the ratio formula. So we can state Stolnacher's hypothesis equivalently in this way, right? Now we can think about Lewis's attack. Lewis presented two triviality results in his probabilities of conditionals and conditional probabilities, although uh, logically the second implies the first, so there was really only one. Uh, a decade later he pre presented a third and a fourth. Anyway, people have presented different versions of Lewis's results. Uh, I'm going to explain the version given in Bennett's book, which apparently comes from Simon Blackburn. Firstly, we need some results from probability logic. First of all, um, the addition theorem, which is that the probability of A equals the probability of B and A plus the probability of not B and A. This is fairly self-evident and it can be proved from the axioms of standard probability logic. I'm not going to give a proof here, just take my word for it. Um, well, just consider it intuitively. Uh, B and not B is a contradiction. So the probability of it obtaining, as long as we're sticking with standard logic, should be zero. Well, that means that the B and not B in B and A and not B and A cancel out. Right? So there's the, the addition theorem. Uh, secondly, if and. Uh, that says that the probability of if A then B given C equals the probability of B given A and C. Uh, again, where the probability of A and C is greater than zero. Uh, again, I won't give a proof of this, but if you consider it intuitively, it obviously makes sense. Let's think about the probability of if A then B given C. What are we doing here? Well, we're hypothetically accepting C into our belief system, and then asking ourselves, on the supposition that C is true, what's the probability that if A then B is true? 
But given Stallnacker's hypothesis, we use the same method to evaluate conditionals. So to evaluate the if A then B part, we hypothetically accept A, and then we see whether this gives a high probability for B. So this means that the, the probability of if A then B given C can be rephrased the probability of B given A then C, then C with the caveat that the probability, of if A then C, the probability of A and C be greater than zero for reasons explained above. So um, let me just repeat that to make sure you've got it. Take the probability of if A then B. Applying Stallnacker's hypothesis, we get the probability of B given A. So it's clear that if we take the probability of if A then B given C, apply Stallnacker's hypothesis again, we should get the probability of B given A and C. As you can see, in each case, what we're, what we're doing is we're moving the, the antecedent of, con, of the conditional to the right of this straight line, basically. So that's kind of what's going on here. We're just shifting it to the right of that straight line. Right. Finally, note that the ratio formula can be equivalently stated in this way. Uh, probability of if A then B equals the probability of B given A times the probability of A. And this is a basic mathematical equivalence, right? So A equals B divided by C, which is the uh, form of the original ratio formula, is equivalent to B equals A times C. And that's the form of this uh, different ratio formula. Stating the ratio formula in this way just makes it easier to present the proof. And we're going to, we'll call this RF2, right? With these facts established, here's the Blackburn version of Lewis's proof. Now, note that throughout this proof, I'm going to use the capital letters Q and R as propositional variables, rather than A and B, as I've been doing throughout the rest of this video. This is just stylistic. I think it makes it easier to see what's being substituted for what. So, we begin with the probability of if Q then R. Simple enough, I hope. The addition theorem tells us this. Now, as you can see, we're simply taking the addition theorem and substituting if Q then R for A and R for B, right? So hopefully you can see how those two match up there. So we have here then that the probability of if Q then R equals the probability of R and if Q then R plus the probability of not R and if Q then R, okay? Now, RF2, which is just the ratio formula, this can be applied to these two bits, and it tells us this. Right, where we had the probability of R and if Q then R, yes, we now have the probability of if Q then R given R times the probability of R, right? Um, and similarly for the second part of the equation. Now, we can take the probability of if Q then R given R and the probability of if Q then R given not R. Uh, so these two bits here, we can take these two bits and apply the if and theorem to each of them. And that will give us number four, this. As you can see, we've uh, changed the probability of if Q then R given R to the probability of R given Q and R and likewise for the second half. So we've changed this to this and this to this. Now, we can note something interesting about number four. Uh, so here it is again. No matter what the probability of Q and R is, the probability of R given Q and R is one. That is, if we hypothetically accept Q and R, so we hypothetically increase the probability of Q and R to one, and then ask ourselves how this alters the probability of R, it's obvious that the probability of R becomes 1. If Q and R is true, R alone must be true too, right? So the probability of R given Q and R is 1. And therefore, the first half of the addition equation, this bit here, this half, simplifies to 1 times the probability of R. And the converse points hold for the second half. So no matter what the probability of Q and R is, the probability of not R given Q and R is zero. If Q and R is true, not R must be false. So the probability of not R given Q and R is zero, so the second half, this part, simplifies to zero times the probability of not R. 
Overall then, we can say that number 4 is equivalent to this. Now, 1 times the probability of r, whatever the probability of r is, is just the probability of r. So this part simplifies to the probability of r. 0 times the probability of not r, whatever the probability of not r is, is 0. So this simplifies to 0. Overall then, we have this. The probability of if q then r equals the probability of r plus 0, which of course is equivalent to the probability of if q then r equals the probability of r. And this is plainly absurd. It's not contradictory, of course, it's, but it's absurd in the colloquial sense. The probability of the conditional if q then r equals the probability of its consequent taken alone probability of if q then r equals the probability of r, and that is absurd. So one of the assumptions that we've used in our proof must be wrong, and the weakest seems to be Stolnacher's hypothesis. Um, it is possible, I believe, to maintain Stolnacher's hypothesis and reject some other part of the proof, but that's not been a very popular response. Um, most people take it that what Lewis has done here is refute Stolnacher's hypothesis. Um, it's important to note uh, that, that Lewis attacks Stolnacher's hypothesis in particular, not the general Ramsey approach that inspired it. There is a subtle distinction, uh, but important, subtle but important distinction between Stolnacher's hypothesis and Ramsey's idea. Um, so consider, for example, Ernest Adams' suggestion that although the probability of B given A doesn't measure the probability of if A then B, it does measure something like the assertability or acceptability of if A then B. So we shouldn't confuse Stolnacher's hypothesis and Ramsey's more intuitive idea. And, and really, I mean, Lewis's proof um, is, really demonstrates that. Anyway, I hope that was of some use. Um, that's that's uh, Lewis's triviality result. I hope, I hope uh, that was useful. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.